The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Elena G. Levine. I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions, and I'm the author of the forthcoming book, Networking for Nerds, which will be published by Wiley early next year. It's my delight and honor today to present for you this wonderful, fabulous webinar on 10 plus, and it's actually a lot more than that, surprising ways you can use LinkedIn to advance your career and your profession. And I'd like to thank the American Geophysical Union and their Career Center for sponsoring this webinar and lots of other professional development and, and career advancement webinars that they do throughout the year. So um, this webinar, as you know, is going to be focusing on LinkedIn. And so I'm going to be doing something where I'm going to actually be going back and forth between slides and giving you a live version of LinkedIn using my own profile on LinkedIn as a case study. But I want to get you sort of familiar with what LinkedIn can provide you and what LinkedIn can offer you to advance your career. And I want to be very clear about this. You should be on LinkedIn whether you are interested in a career in academia, and I mean a direct career uh, in academia straight through to the tenure track position where all you'd be doing is tenure track, being a tenure track faculty or if you want to do something beyond academia. In other words, LinkedIn now spans all of the sectors, academia, industry, nonprofit, association, government, and so on and so forth. So even if you think, well, you know what, Elena, I know for a fact all I'm going to be doing is going into academia, maybe doing research. First of all, you don't know that that's necessarily going to happen. There's other options that may come up that may seem more tantalizing to you as you do your career exploration, which, by the way, you can do using LinkedIn. But second of all, it doesn't matter because even on, even in academia, more and more professionals, meaning professors, deans, decision makers, provosts, even presidents, are being found and are looking on LinkedIn for candidates that they would bring into their academic institution for postdocs, for postdoctoral positions, for professors, and so on and so forth. In other words, you have to be on LinkedIn right now, at least, this, at, least, at least at this point in history, to make sure that people see you so that you can be found and be offered um, potential access to hidden opportunities. So we're going to talk more about that. So just a quick couple of housekeeping issues. If for some reason you can't hear, can't see, or if there's a problem, just log out and log back in. And take a note that there are going to be opportunities for you to ask questions. There's a question box in your console for this webinar, and I'm going to answer all the questions at the end, and any questions that I don't get a chance to answer, I will be able to answer them via an article that I'll be producing as a companion to this webinar in the future. And the recording of this webinar should be also available too, so you'll be able to go back and, and review it for your records. Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is looking at how and why LinkedIn works, and in particular why it works in academia and how it works in academia. We're going to address social media networking pillars, which you should always keep in the back and front of your mind whenever you're doing any sort of networking activity on LinkedIn. And then we're going to focus on four categories of activities or four categories of outputs on LinkedIn. And I'm going to show you what those are in just a moment. But basically, we're going to focus on our profile. We're going to focus on our activities in groups. We're going to focus on connections. And we're going to focus on searching and being very strategic in our searching. And that's where those wonderful, hidden, surprising ways that LinkedIn can help you are going to materialize in those four areas. So let's start off by discussing why LinkedIn, because I know a lot of you, especially those of you that are in academia right now, and those of you that may be early in your career, so you're an undergraduate or graduate or a graduate student or you're a postdoc, and you're thinking, well, my PI isn't on LinkedIn, so why should I be on LinkedIn? And the reason is, is because right now, as I mentioned, more and more people are doing basic LinkedIn searches when people apply for jobs. That's in academia and outside of academia. So when you send me, let's say I run a laboratory at the University of Arizona. That's my alma mater, so I always have to mention that. Let's say I run a laboratory in the geosciences department, and you read my paper in Nature, and you think it's fantastic, and you want to work for me as a postdoc, and you email me. Well, if you send me a convincing letter that makes me want to learn more about you, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to Google you. I'm going to Google, do a Google search to find out exactly what is online about you. 
And one of the things that's going to pop up in the Google search, if you're on LinkedIn, is your LinkedIn profile, which is very important. And if for some reason I Google you and I can't find anything on, about you on LinkedIn, I'm then going to go onto LinkedIn and I'm going to do a LinkedIn search within the LinkedIn borders to find you, to see what your profile is. I do that nowadays myself with anybody that interacts with me. Anybody who cold emails me or anybody that I'm going to have a meeting with, I almost always look at their LinkedIn profile before I have a meeting with them. Because I want to understand a little bit more about what they do, what they've done, what, where their passions lie, what they're excited about, what their goals are. All these things are on their LinkedIn profile. So what's happening is, is that as you're reaching out and you're networking and you're connecting with people that are potential employers or potential collaborators, they're going to be looking for you on LinkedIn. And the idea behind LinkedIn is that it is essentially about six degrees of separation. So six degrees of separation, you know this. It's a theory, which I believe has been proven, that says that every person on the planet is connected to every other person on the planet by no more than six degrees. So I know somebody who knows somebody who knows Bill Gates. I actually know, I'm actually only two degrees away from Bill Gates. But I bet of all the thousands of you that are listening to this webinar today, if you were to interact with each other, you would probably find that there were quite a few of you that are only one degree away from Bill Gates. And that's the way LinkedIn works. See, what happens is that you go on LinkedIn and you do a search for somebody, and it'll tell, or a company, or a location, or a field, and LinkedIn will tell you how many degrees of separation there are between you and your goal, you and that person, you and that organization or company, you and that industry, even you and that somebody working in that location. And this is very important because what happens is as you build connections on LinkedIn, as you expand out, you develop quite a close relationship. So the degrees of separation between you and Bill Gates or you and Microsoft, if you want to work for Microsoft, or you and Schlumberger, or you and Swiss Re, or any of these companies, or you and Harvard, or you and Caltech, or what have you, those degrees of separation become smaller and smaller and smaller. And what we find is that we end up finding people that are already in the companies and organizations and teams that we want to work in. And that gives us access to hidden opportunities, right? Because that's the, the, one of the values that you get from networking in that when I apply for a job at your university or your company, um, it's good to already have an insider within that organization who can sort of walk me through and say, hey, Elena is great. You should look at her CV. You should look at her resume. And LinkedIn gives you is a tool to be able to find people that are inside the organizations that you endeavor to work in so that you could then connect with them, speak with them, network with them, and then perhaps they could even assist you in giving you information about how the workplace is operate, operates, the culture of the organization, and could even help you get a job there too. Now, that's the idea. So we want to decrease the degrees of separation between ourselves and the organizations that are our goal, are our goal organizations where we like to work or where, with whom we like to collaborate. And as I mentioned, because LinkedIn is the professional marketplace, and what that means is that it's the, when I say professional here, I mean somebody who is serious about their craft. Somebody who is a professional is somebody who's serious about their craft. So here, LinkedIn acts as the marketplace to communicate information about professions and professionals. So people who, not are, who are amateurs, but people who are really interested in building careers or have built careers in that particular field or discipline or industry. So anytime I need somebody, uh, or I'm going to go on LinkedIn for the most part, I'm going to look for them. So it is the place to be found, and it's also the place to find others and to connect with them so that we can, again, reduce that those degrees of separation so we have those contacts. And people are searching here for candidates, and that even goes for faculty positions. More and more academics, search committees, they get the list of people that are applying for a job within your department, at, within your interested department at, let's say, Caltech, and they are going onto LinkedIn and they're taking a look at your profile. And they want to see what you're saying, what you're, how you're promoting yourself, what your interests are, how you are representing yourself to the public. And we want them to see something that's really pristine, something that's really um, important and de de demonstrative of the entire talent that you are. Okay. So also, related to this, why LinkedIn? Because it is the appropriate self-promotion channel for professionals. So Facebook right now, 
although people are on Facebook, I'm on Facebook. I have two Facebook pages. So I have one Facebook page that's purely just for me and my friends. So we make jokes, we pass around pictures of cats and, you know, dogs and little animals that are really super cute and we make lots of physics jokes and science jokes and things like that. And I, God believe it, believe it or not, I actually do curse and I curse on that Facebook group, right? I'll, I'll drop the F-bomb here and there to my friends on that Facebook group. But on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is more for professionals. In fact, it's exclusively for professionals. So I'm going to be promoting myself on LinkedIn in a very formal and very professional manner. So I would never use the F word. I never use any other divisive language that I could possibly that could possibly be taken in the wrong way or, or offensive language that could be taken in or out of context. I also make a note, I don't use offensive language even when I'm talking to my friends because of course nothing is actually private on the internet, right? But what I wanted to do was just give you a distinguishing note between how people are using Facebook at the moment, which may change in the future. They're using it more for fun. Um, they're using it more to, you know, hang out and communicate with their friends, and that's good. There's also groups on Facebook, and like I said, I have another page, which is just for my company, Quantum Success Solutions, where people can like my company and they get information related to career development for scientists and engineers, because that's what my company's goals are. Um, but LinkedIn still is the place where I can promote myself appropriately and communicate all the awards I've won, all the things I've done, all the different things, clients I've worked with and things like that. And it's totally appropriate. So it's not something like you don't have to think that I'm bragging when I'm going on LinkedIn and communicating that I won this award or I did have this honor. That's not bragging. That's telling the, the truth about information that is strategic for the audience, whoever that audience is, to know. So what you do is when you're on LinkedIn in your profile and also when you're active in groups and in other actions, which we're going to talk about, what you're doing is you're creating digital trails to your brand, to your promise of value, to your work. So people are getting to know you. And what that does is it solidifies your brand, your promise of value in their minds, and then it starts to amplify your reputation. In other words, it carries your reputation to places that you wouldn't have expected, to people you wouldn't have expected to locations and organizations and, and places that could be potential employers for you. And it does, definitely shows your dedication to your field and it can demonstrate you or align you essentially as a contributor and a thought leader in your field. And that's really what one of the major goals of using LinkedIn is to make sure that people see us as a contributor and a thought leader. A lot of that comes out in the actions in the groups, which we'll get to in a moment. So a couple of pillars of importance with networking on social media. And those of you who've heard me talk about networking before and social media in general, you may have heard these. But for those of you who are new to this, I want to just make sure that you know. So we want to follow these pillars and keep them in our minds always as we're engaging LinkedIn or any other social media. Because first and foremost, and I'm going to jump ahead, we cannot let, absolutely, we cannot let uh, any activity that we do online, including LinkedIn, become a time sink. Right? The most important thing for your career are your outputs associated with success in your career. Right? So if you're interested in an academic career, the outputs that are important are publishing, presenting at conferences, getting grants, doing service, teaching, and things of that nature. And if you're spending, you know, 75 hours a week on LinkedIn doing whatever, and you don't write that paper because of it, or you don't go to the conference because of it, or you, you know, miss out on a teaching opportunity, the, that negatively, of course, is going to impact your brand, and it's going to negatively impact your reputation, and nothing on LinkedIn is going to be able to help fix that. We have to make sure that whatever we're doing is part of our outputs that are associated with success in our industry, in our career, maintain at the highest level, and we don't let social media, whether it's LinkedIn or something else, become a time sink. So we have to be strategic about how much time we spend on it and what we do there. So just to begin with the pillars of importance, we're going to be professional at all times and all ways. In other words, everything that I do on LinkedIn is going to be demonstrative of me as a professional. Me as a professional. Now, I am a professional writer. I'm a professional speaker, as you all know, and it's obviously clear from this webinar. I'm also a professional comedian. I do event planning. I do career consulting. I do communications training. I do a lot of stuff. So, But these are all areas of my profession. So whenever I go on LinkedIn and whenever I post something in a group or connect with somebody on LinkedIn, I'm always being professional. In other words, I'm always trying to contribute to the professional 
intellectual capacity and capability of the group, of the people that are using LinkedIn. So I'm not sending them pictures of cats with glasses because that's not professional. Instead, I'm posting things that are appropriate, that are appropriate for the profession. You know, like for example, I posted something on a LinkedIn group for science writers about a $10,000 media um, fellowship for journalists, which I thought would be interesting. And I wasn't going to be partaking of it, but even if I was, I wanted to have other people know about it, and so I posted it in a group. That's related to my profession, and that's definitely something that the, the profession would be interested in. So that's an example of being professional. It's also an example of me being dynamic. And what you want to do here is you want to engage on LinkedIn. You don't want to just be sort of like lurking there and watching. You want to be active. And the way you act on LinkedIn, the way you're dynamic on LinkedIn, is by essentially being proactive and reactive in your engagement. Um, I'm going to go into more detail about that in a few minutes. But the idea in one case study you can look at on LinkedIn is in the groups, being proactive in groups and being reactive in groups. In other words, in groups, you can start the conversation. You can start a new post that's being proactive. And reactive in a group is where I post something and you respond to the post. We're going to talk more about that. But if you add new content regularly in groups, on your profile, and so on and so forth, as well as in other channels, like for example, there's an opportunity for you to um, quote unquote keep in touch, which I'm going to show you in a moment, that adds new content regularly, that allows you to engage, and more of that keeps people engaged with you, they keep seeing you, it amplifies your brand, it establishes you as a thought leader and a contributor to your community. So, of course, also related to this is we're going to be valuable, right? We're only going to add something of value. That's why I added, that's why I posted that journalism fellowship because I knew that was going to be valuable to the community, right? Uh, posting a picture of a cat is not going to be valuable to a journalism community. Uh, on LinkedIn, right? To my friends, they love pictures of cats, particularly cats that hold like little pipettes and like all sorts of interesting, you know, a uh, cat in front of a scanning electron microscope and a, scat, a cat uh, hanging out in uh, next to a big old uh, you know, volcano or what have you, something cute associated with science and engineering. But that's not valuable on LinkedIn. The culture of LinkedIn is that the value is related to how can I move my career, how can I move my profession, how can I move my field forward. So when you post something, you should always be thinking, is this of value to the community? In other words, is this going to help somebody move their career forward, move their profession forward, move their organization forward, their field forward, their department forward, and so on and so forth? Additionally, we want to be seen. We want to be seen, right? So it's like when you go networking to, when you go to a conference and you go to a mixer, you want to be seen walking around the room, right? You want to work the room. That's important. People need to see you. They need to see you engaging other people. And so, that's why I was saying you don't want to just work on LinkedIn. You want to actually be active on LinkedIn. So you need to be seen. But of course, most importantly, is you have to be seen in a positive light. So people have to see you in a way that's reflective of your positive brand, your promise of value, your high, your high and positive attitude, your high reputation. We also want to be consistent. In other words, we want to continuously postings. If, and we want people to be expecting, just like brands are about promises, we want people to be expecting that when they see something from us, it's always going to be something of value, something dynamic, something that engages. And then finally, we, are, we already mentioned about this being a potential time sink, so we're going to be careful about that. But the final thing I just want to remember, want to, to remind you of, is of course that cyberspace, no matter what social media uh, site you use, whether you use ResearchGate or LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or anything, Cyberspace is forever space. So whatever you put out there is going to be there forever. And also whatever you put out there does have the potential to be seen by any potential employer, potential granting agency, potential collaborator, and you get my point. So we want to always make sure, and that's why it's so important to be positive, right? To be seen in a positive light because, my goodness, we don't want somebody to make a decision um, based on uh, bad decision, of the decision not to engage you or not to hire you or not to bring you into their team or to give you a grant based on something that you put onto LinkedIn or on some other social media site that is negative or that could be construed as negative. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about those four sort of subject areas of how you can use LinkedIn. And like I said, 10 plus, when I was doing this for a webinar, preparing it for you, I realized I actually have a lot more than 10. So we're going to go through all of them. But first I want to just give you sort of an introduction to LinkedIn and give you sort of a 
an overview of what you can find. So I'm going to pull up my own profile here on LinkedIn so that you can see it. So this is what you see when you are already on LinkedIn. And by the way, that's your, the first and foremost homework assignment today is to launch a LinkedIn profile. Um, once you're on LinkedIn, when you log into LinkedIn, the first thing you're going to see, this is the home page, right? And so these are different updates that come from my connections and from the different people that I follow. I'm going to talk to you about that more in a moment. Um, it tells me people that I might know based on people that I've been emailing, you know, with data analytics and so on and so forth. It gives me an idea of things that I've recently visited. And hello, I just recently visited the AGU company website, which I'm going to show, a company LinkedIn page, which I'm going to show you in a moment. It shows me that there's 13 people who just viewed my profile in the last two days, three days. I'm going to give you more information about that. I can give you some more information over here. But I just wanted you to sort of see what you can, what, what you see first off. And right here, this is going to be your lifeline, these, these menu bars right up here. Um, so uh, you have your profile, uh, which is right over here. That's the first uh, opportunity for you on the menu bar. You have connections, you have jobs, and then you have interests. So we were talking about the profile. So let me go back to the profile for a second. And these are the things that we want to keep in mind about when we're putting together our profile, and these are one, some of the 10 plus surprising ways that actually LinkedIn can really work for your benefit in terms of finding a job or even finding a career. So I'm going to go to my profile, I'm going to click on profile, and I just click on the blue profile and it brings up my profile. And I want to point out a couple of things to you on my profile that you should know. Okay, so first of all, there's my name, obviously, okay. Next thing you see here is a catchy headline. Now, I want this, you, this is one of those surprising things that you should actually be incorporating into your, pro, into your LinkedIn profile. A lot of people, especially early in their career, write student, comma, geoscience is the University of Arizona. Um, and that's oh, an okay headline. But really what we want to do with the headline is we want to tell people what we can do for them, right? Because the job search process is never about what I, the job seeker, can get from you, the decision maker, or the hiring manager. It's always what I can do for you, the decision maker, the hiring manager. So we want to put a nice headline here that describes some of our skill sets, some of our higher level skill sets or, or, or sub-disciplines that we're an expert in. And don't think that just because you're an undergraduate or a graduate student or a postdoc, in other words, that you're very early in your career, that you can't write student in geosciences with an expertise or with interest in X, Y, and Z. You can do that because we want people to find you. And if you do have an interest in certain things, in certain careers, this is a great way that people are going to find you. See, what happens is if I do a search, let's say I am hiring in a company for somebody who knows geosciences, who's done outreach, and also knows about, let's say, X and X, let's say data analytics, okay? And let's say those are your areas of expertise or those are your interests. Those are the things that you're working hard as a student or a postdoc to really cement as part of your brand. You can make that as part of your, your headline. And then when I do a search, the first thing that's going to come up is going to be the people that have headlines that match that, those search criteria, those three things that I was interested in, outreach, geosciences, and X, and in this case, it's data analytics. So if you have that in your headline, you're going to be the first person who comes up, and I'm going to click on your LinkedIn profile, and I'm going to be able to view you and see whether or not I want to invite you to apply to this uh, department or invite you to apply for this job. And by the way, I want to be very clear here that this is not stuff I'm making up. <laughs> I don't live in imagination land. The things that I'm telling you about what LinkedIn can do for you and the examples that I'm giving you for what LinkedIn can do for you are all examples that are based in truth and are based in actual experiences that I have had or people I, have known, people I know have had. In other words, I know people who have been found because of their headline. I know, in fact, I've been found because of my headline. People do a search for, like, you know, science writer and nerds and, and um, you know, and, and comedian, and, and mine is the only one that comes up. So I, I'm not just making this stuff up. This is, this is based in fact. Okay, so we got, we put together a nice catchy headline that is based on what we want to promote about ourselves. What we want the, the outside world, the audience, or in particular, the hiring people, the people, the hiring managers, or the decision makers, what will we want them to know about us and why they might, what we could potentially do for them. So that's important. 
So another thing that's really important, a little surprising, but actually very important, is the picture. Now this is a picture of me. Hello, I'm Elena. Now what's important about this picture is that you can you can see my eyeballs there, okay? And that's really important. It's a headshot. It's tight. Um, in, in other words, it's a tightly focused headshot. Um, you can see my eyes. And there have been LinkedIn studies. In fact, LinkedIn produced a study that says that profiles that have a picture, so profiles that have a picture are seven times more likely to be viewed by other people than profiles that do not have a picture. That's how important a profile picture is to your network, to your LinkedIn profile. So make sure you have a picture. Uh, make sure they can see your eyes. Um, make sure you're not wearing anything inappropriate. So you know, no, you know, you know, scantily dressed, nothing like that. Nothing, you know, nothing with your, your tongue hanging out. This isn't a uh, a picture for your friends um, when you got drunk on Christmas Eve. This is a picture for other professionals who may hire you. So you need to look professional. And quite honestly, you should be smiling because you're happy. You're a happy nerd. It's exciting to be in geophysics. It's exciting to be in science and engineering. So for goodness sake, smile and show that enthusiasm. Um, now, the only uh, exception, I would say, to this rule of a tight picture of you know where I can see your eyes and you're smiling would be what I saw in one of my colleagues' uh, profiles on LinkedIn, which was she showed a picture of herself with a piece of instrumentation. Now, that instrumentation was very important to her brand, and it was very important for people to know that she could use that instrument if she was going to get a job in her area of geophysics. So her picture was her with this instrument, and even though you couldn't really see her eyes very, very well because her, her face was a little bit smaller, the fact that it was with the instrument was the more important picture and, and an, a more important point. So that's the only exception. But definitely put a picture. And the other thing about the picture is that if you don't put a picture, people are going to wonder, well, why didn't they put a picture? Is there something that they don't want people to know about them? Now, of course, it has nothing to do with um, any sort of, um, and I'm not talking about bias here. That's not what I'm talking about. But I, I want to make sure that people see you as the happy nerd that you are, that you're excited to join their organization, um, and that they don't wonder, why would they not put a picture? Maybe they they're, don't want people to see something about themselves. Um, maybe they don't like to smile or whatever. And so we want to make sure that no negative questions come into play. Now, another thing that I have on my profile, which is really important, is this right here, right under my picture. It's called the customized URL. Uh, and this customized URL, you can actually make yourself. So what you do is you go into Edit Profile, and right over here, um, I go into Edit Profile. And what's going to happen is it's going to, a new page is going to come up. And then it's going to say, right over here, next to the, under the profile picture, is my URL for my LinkedIn profile. And then it says Edit. I'm going to click on that. And then what happens is you get this page here. And down at the bottom, right in that far right corner, in the bottom, it says Customize your public profile URL. And you want to have a profile URL that is customized. The default URL that's provided for profiles is simply just, you know, linkedin.com slash in slash your name, and then a, like a whole gobbledygook of numbers and letters. But we want people to be able to easily find you. And you're going to start, this is one of the surprising aspects of LinkedIn that you can use to further your, your career and your profession. You want to be able to put your profile on your CV, on your resume, in, the, in your email signature, and even on your business card if you produce them, which you should. So by having a customized URL that's simply just slash in slash your name, this allows you to be able to do that more easily. And it also, it's, it's a lot easier for me to say, hey, go to my profile if you want to learn more about me. Click here, slash in, slash Elena G. Levine, as opposed to slash Elena G. Levine, slash X, Y, 2, blah, 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 blah. So we want to use that customized URL. OK. I'm going to come back to this, in, this, this screen in a little bit, but I want to go back to my profile for a moment to show you some other things that were important um, aspects of that category relating to the profile. So we have the catchy headline, we have the fun picture, smiling picture, we have the customized URL. And then I'm going to scroll down here a little bit, past my experience, which is also important. But I want to come to the skills. This is a very important section here. 
skills. You can list up to 50, five zero skills at the moment. They might even expand that later. The skills are important to list, and it's important to use all 50 skills that are provided. Because what happens is, is again, if I'm doing a search for somebody who has an expertise, and look at my profile here. I have an expertise in public speaking, blogging, editing, public relations. These are the skills that I pick to put on my profile. So if somebody does need somebody who has an expertise in public speaking, blogging, editing, and public relations, and they do a search on LinkedIn, I am going to be found. That's what we want to do. When we list the skills out, we're going to be found by the people that are making decisions on whether or not they want to hire us or go forward with us in terms of maybe putting together an alliance or some sort of strategic partnership. So we definitely want to list the skills, and the way you list the skills is you go back up to the top and you click on Edit Profile, right here, Edit Profile, and it'll give you an opportunity to, to list the skills. And by the way, the skills that you list, you don't have to come up with them out of thin air. That's one of the beauties of LinkedIn is that it gives you a list of skills that you can go through and pick which skills that you want to use on your profile. And that keeps it consistent across everybody's profiles. In other words, everybody's calling it data analytics as opposed to something else. So that means I know that if I'm going to do a search for somebody, I need to do a search for data analytics as opposed to another term. And that way I would find you and I'd find other people that had listed that skill. So that's important. So I a note, one last note about the skills here, which is not that important, but I want you just bring it to your attention. So right next to the skills that are listed. So the skills are very important. You have to list out the skills. And by the way, I know a lot of people, especially people who are early in their career, who only list out like four skills, right? They list like research, they list geoscience, they list uh, maybe R or Python or C++ or Java, and they list like higher education, and that's it. But, but give yourself a better chance of being found by more decision makers by using all 50 skills that you can use and be diverse about it, right? Think more strategically. Think about the scientific problem solving skills that you have, the engineering problem solving skills you have, the computing and other types of technical skills you have, as well as the business and leadership and management and project management and communication skills you have. And then even your linguistic skills. Um, you can even list that too. So we want to make sure that people can find you in all these ways. So for those of you that are new to LinkedIn, you might be wondering who are all of these pictures of that are next to my skills? And what is this number next to public speaking? There's the number 40 right next to it. And next to blogging, it says number 39. What is that all about? This is endorsements. Now, endorsements at the moment, in this point in history, are not that important in LinkedIn. In other words, you can get endorsements, but it's not as important as other aspects of your profile, which I'm going to talk about more in a moment. So what happens with endorsements? If you're on LinkedIn, you might know that what the way the computer programs run on LinkedIn is, as I add connections, LinkedIn will push me an invitation, invitation is probably not the right word, but will push me a request, and it will say, do you want to endorse Mary Jones for social media? Do you want to, want to endorse you know, um, Annette Connor for uh, geophysics? So it will actually ask me, do I want to endorse certain people that are connections of mine for their skills? And then if I say yes, then what happens is on their profile, on Mary Jones's profile, it shows that Elena Levine has endorsed her for this particular skill. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing the computer. I didn't ask these people to endorse me. The computer program that's being run on LinkedIn asked my connections, does Elena know public speaking? Does Elena know blogging or editing or fundraising? And my connection said yes. And as a result, they are now, quote unquote, endorsing that skill. Now you see there's a lot there, right? There's 40, and I think you can get up to 99 endorsements for each skill. But the reason why I said that the endorsements are not that important is because, quite honestly, the way LinkedIn works with asking me if I want to endorse Mary Jones for this particular skill, I can just say yes or no in a blink of an eye and then go on with my day. I don't necessarily know anything about Mary Jones' expertise in fundraising, or higher education, or blogging, or whatever LinkedIn asks me to whether or not I want to endorse her for. 
So it's a very unreliable way of saying, I, wow, all these people, 40 people have endorsed me for public speaking, but quite honestly, all 40 of them might not have seen me speak in public. Um, eight people here have endorsed me for community outreach, but I guarantee that not all eight of those have in interacted with me to see that I do community outreach. So it's not very reliable right now. It may change in the future, but it's not very reliable. There are other things that are more reliable that we'll get to. So don't worry about getting endorsements. You can add endorsements. You can do endo the endorsing yourself, and that's totally fine. Um, but I don't want you to put a lot of attention to it at the moment. All right, so I want to also show you some other things that should be on your profile. You should have a summary, of course, which goes into some detail about who you are and what you do. Um, people write it as bullet points. Some people write it as paragraphs. As you can see, that's what I did here. And you'll have a chance, of course, you can go into my profile and take a look at this later. And then, I, of course, I list my experiences, the different jobs that I've had, um, and a little bit more information about each of those jobs. Um, scrolling down, there's another section that I can add. I list my projects. So this is one project that I was particularly proud of, so I put that, but you can list other projects. Um, I listed my honors and awards. So here, again, we're not bragging. We're just telling the truth of the fellowships or the awards or the grants that we've gotten. And if it needs to be explained, like in this case, I won Tucson Leader of the Year. And unless you live in Tucson, you might not realize how you know prestigious that is or how important it is. So I wrote that it was also an honor bestowed upon U.S. Surgeon former U.S. Surgeon General Kurt Carmona, because I want people to know that it's not some crappy award. It's actually pretty important. And the same thing goes with some of these other awards. But do tell people the awards that you've won. You've got your skills. You've got your education. I only list my high school. In this case, I list my high school because I come from a high school that was pretty prestigious. It's still prestigious in the state of New Jersey. Um, and so I want people to know that. If you went to a private school or a particular boarding school, I would list it. But quite honestly, if you want other people from your high school to find you, and it's not necessarily prestigious high school, it's not you know um, this particular prep or that particular prep, go ahead and list it because people are going to do searches for high school people, people from their high school, and why not be found that way too? I have done searches for people from my high school, and because they listed West Windsor Plainsboro High School on their LinkedIn profile, I was able to find them. Turns out one of them is a booker for one of the major TV talk shows in the United States. And I couldn't believe that. I got so excited. So I would have never known that had I not put that on there and had I not searched for it and had he not put it on his profile. Additional information, I include my advice for contacting me. So I include my email so they can find me. I can add additional organizations. Um, and there's lots of other different um, topics or lots of, it, lots of other different subcategories that you can add to complete your profile. And if you just click on complete your profile, it will give you all the different examples of different subcategories that you can list. Um, but those are the major important ones that you want to think about. Um, now, a couple of final surprising ways that you can use LinkedIn, especially um, to promote yourself and to communicate your expertise with decision makers. So one of the cool things that you can do on LinkedIn is you can create your profile in another language. Holy mackerel! I didn't even realize that until just recently. So if you saw what I did, just to, to go back, I'm going to go back to my profile so you can see how I did it. I hovered over Edit Profile and this little arrow right here. And just to the right of it, it says, gives me an opportunity, it says click or create profile in another language. This is on my profile. So I click on that, and then I can choose the language not a lot of languages, I must admit. There's not that many languages here. Hopefully one of the languages that you speak and want to communicate your profile in, in is here. But if not, you can select, select other. And then you can change your how, headline. You can even add a former name here and so on and so forth. And what it does is it translates your profile into another language. This is a really great thing to do, especially for those of you that are looking to move to a different country or want to find a job in another country where they speak a different language. You know, if I was interested in working in France, I would create my profile in another language. So that in Fran in French, of course, so that people who in French who in France who speak French, who are decision makers, would be able to read my profile. So very, very useful tool to really expand your reach for people to see you and to know who you're know who you are. So another thing that's important that is that is really, really important associated with your profile is 
who has viewed your profile. So if you hover over the word profile on the big black bar at the top of your screen, you see edit profile and then you see who's viewed my profile. And I'm going to click on that, who's viewed my profile. You can get to that from your own profile page as well. Now, I want to point out here that this uh, feature of who's viewed my profile has enabled me and people I know to actually get jobs. So this feature actually gave me money. It got me gigs. It got me jobs. It got me paid opportunities. And likewise, it has gotten colleagues of mine paid opportunities too. So how does it work? It tells you who has viewed your profile. Now, of course, some people, like for example, this person right here, because of the way they set up their privacy settings, and I'm going to go into that later in the, in the webinar, they set up their privacy settings so that I can't see who they are. I know that somebody who is a graduate assistant at UC Santa Cruz saw my profile today. Um, so I don't know who that person is. That's true. There's not, you, you won't get the entire picture, but you'll get a sense. Like here, for example, I see this person, Bill Goward, he looked at my profile today. So this is important for me to know because, hey, Guess what? If Bill Gates looks at my profile and I'm able to see that, I can go look at Bill Gates' profile and then I can send him an in-mail. This is a, the email system through LinkedIn. I can send him an in-mail or I can invite him to connect and say, hey, I saw you looked at my profile. Maybe there's an opportunity for us to collaborate. Could we have a conversation about it? And it actually starts, it's, it oils the conversation. It starts the conversation and starts the opportunity for networking. So when I say that people who I've gotten jobs from this, is what happens is I've seen people, I look at this, this feature multiple times a day, I see who's looking at my profile, and then I reach out to them. And if it's somebody that I really would like to work with, I'm going to connect with them. And I'm going to say, hey, I saw your, prof your profile. It looks like there's a uh, you know, collaboration opportunity, or it looks like there's definitely synchronicity or synergy between what we're working on. Why don't we have a conversation to talk about it? And it has given me an opportunity to connect with people that I might not otherwise have connected. So this is an important feature. But I do want to point out right now, if you look at the top of the screen right here in the black bar next to the in signal, in uh, icon there, it says the word premium. I actually have a upgraded version of LinkedIn that costs money. Um, and it, it's called the premium membership, which allows me to have a larger picture of who's looked at my profile. So if you get the free version, you don't get the complete picture. You get to see, you know, like maybe a certain percentage of the people that have viewed your profile. So for those of you that are early in your job search, like let's say you're, you know you're going to need a job in May and you're starting early in your job search, you probably don't need to pay the premium price, which I think is probably $50 or $75 a month. But as you get closer, I think it might be worth investing in it. And you can always cancel at any time. And I don't work for LinkedIn. I want to be clear about that. I do not work for LinkedIn. But I think you want to maybe think about investing in a premium membership so that you can get this bigger picture. And it also gives you the opportunity to send in-mails as opposed to just um, corresponding with somebody by connecting with them. You can actually send in-mails if you have the premium version. So I've known postdocs, for example, who are, know they're going to, their postdoc is ending. They've used LinkedIn for many, many months to do some research, to find people to connect with, and so on and so forth. And then as they're getting closer to their, the end of their postdoc, let's say four months out, they, they start buying the premium version for each month, and it has netted them results. And I mentioned postdoc specifically because I actually heard a postdoc at Berkeley say that this is how she got her job. She went on to LinkedIn. She had a profile. She did all the things we're talking about today. And she made sure to invest in the premium. So she saw that Dr. X looked at her profile. And she went to Dr. X's profile, emailed, emailed him, connected with him, made an appointment to talk further with him, and it netted her a job. So this is something to consider. But it's really interesting to see because you get a chance to see who is looking, where are they finding you. Um, like, take a look at this. It shows me, see this person here, Marina, we connected last week. So it shows me that she's a first degree contact. But here's another person who's a second degree contact. So it tells me the degrees of separation away from them. And here, this little number right here in the corner shows me who is the person that is connecting us. In other words, Paul Kent is a second degree connection. So there's one person in between me and Paul. And it's this person, this particular person um, over here. 
for um, this other person, for somebody else who, uh, here, this person is in the third degree, if I hover over it, it should show me how many people are between me and uh, how many people could potentially connect me with this particular person. So these are lots of different options for you to, to, to look at while you're, while you're doing searches. So who's viewed your profile is really, really important. And then finally, there was one more thing I wanted to show you related to profiles. This is important, and it's actually going to be expanding out quite a bit now. So um, this used to be a premium, I believe a premium feature or a feature for premium um, holders only, but now it's going to be available to everyone. So I'm going to go to my home, not my profile page, but the home. So I'm going to click home at the top of the screen there. And you see here this picture of me at the top, and there's a little field where I can write stuff, right? So I'm writing stuff right now. And what this is, is, is this is an update. And this is one of the things that you should be doing, is you should be updating your connections, updating your networks about what you're doing. So like, um, hi, I am excited to be doing a webinar on LinkedIn for AGU today. That would be something that I might write. Um, and I would share that. So that's certainly something that you can do to engage. Remember, we talked about being dynamic and engaging. So if you have an update, if you want to share something, this is how you can share it. And you can even tie it to um, your um, Twitter feed if you have one. But the more, more important thing I wanted to show you was a blog post opportunity. So right over here in the corner of this field is a little pencil. And it's very hard to see, but if you look carefully, you'll see it. And it says, create a post. And if I click on that pencil to create a post, what it does is it allows me to actually create a blog. So LinkedIn, as I said, this currently is only exclusive to premium members, but they're about to open it to everybody. So that's why I want you to know about this, because this is a way for you to actually host a blog on LinkedIn. You will maintain all publishing rights. In other words, you will, all, you will own everything you write. It's not LinkedIn's property. It's yours but it allows you to keep your network more informed about what you're working on. And over here, it gives you a getting started guide and tells you what's going on. And if you can publish it, you can tweet about it. I'm going to close this for a second, but because I want to show you something. Because this is sort of my console right here, which shows me what's happening in terms of my post. Now, I haven't posted anything yet. I'm going to start doing that soon. But it shows me what I've published, which is zero right now, um, drafts, zero, and then the followers. And take a look at this right here. Over here, it says in the corner, on the right there, next to the blue sign that says create a new post, it shows me that I have over 1,200 people following me. So what that means is that 1,200 people, when I publish something, are going to get a notice that I published something. They're going to get a notice that I published a blog post. And this is such a great opportunity for you to promote yourself. You're not going to write about how great you are. You're not going to write how 10 reasons why Elena is awesome. That's not what you're going to write. You're going to write things that are valuable, that are relevant to the community, that are important for them to move forward in their profession, right? So if you're wondering where you should post, excuse me, post a blog, you might consider posting it and hosting it on LinkedIn, and you can create a new post right there. So that was the profile. So let me go back to the slides for a moment, just to do a quick summary of what we've been talking about. So this is what we were doing. We're doing our profile. We're making a catchy headline. We're putting a picture where we're smiling, excited about science, showing our eyes if we can, customizing our URL, which we can use in other media. We're going to list out those skills. We're going to publish our post, which is the blog, which stay tuned. They said that within a few weeks that will be open to everybody with free accounts. Um, we're going to think about creating a profile in another language, especially if we're looking at jobs or career opportunities outside of our the country where we live or the country where we um, currently are, are residing or, or where we're from. And then we're going to really, really leverage who's viewed our profile to see what types of opportunities we can create from people who've looked at our profile. Okay. Now we've looked at the profile. Now let's look at the groups. All right. So the groups are very, very important. You can join up to 50, five zero groups on LinkedIn. And groups, in my opinion, although your profile is the, the basis of LinkedIn, the most return on your investment of the time that you spend on LinkedIn, if you spend it mostly in groups, in posting, in both reactive and proactive posting in groups, and then doing some other things in groups, you will actually get the biggest return on your investment. So I actually encourage you to spend most of your time 
using the groups and leveraging your groups. So let's take a look at the groups and I'm going to go through some of these things. So here's, let's go back to my profile. So I'm going to click on profile. So you can just take a quick look. If you scroll down to the bottom of my profile, you can see here are my groups. So I have, I'm a member of 50 groups as I mentioned. These are just some of them. Hello, where's AGU? Let me find AGU's group. There's AGU right there. And what's really great is that you can see whenever you're interested in joining a group, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment, you can see how many members there are of the group. Now I want you to also note that, um, and it might be a little hard to see here, but you can choose whether or not you want to make your group membership visible to the public. In other words, do I want people to see that I'm a member of AGU or do I want to hide that? Now, if I was applying for a job or whatever, that there's nothing wrong. You want, I think it's important for people to see that you're a member of AGU group or ESA group or AAAS group, groups that are related to your field, your industry. However, if I was currently in a job where um, maybe let's say an industry job and I was looking to get out of it and I was looking for another job, it might not be a good idea for me to have visible the fact that I'm a member of the group that's called Science Jobs, right? Because we don't want my employer, which could see this profile, to see that I'm looking at a, I'm a member of a group called Science Jobs, that I'm looking at jobs in other places. So you can make that hidden if you want. You can make it visible or you can make it hidden. I think almost all of my groups are visible because I want people to know that I'm a member of all these groups so that they know where I'm, where I'm acting, where I'm pro being um, involved, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's an important thing is, is being in the group. So let me go into AGU's group. I'm going to click on AGU group. Okay, and so what happens is we see the AGU group here. I'm going to show you how to get to this group in another way in a moment. All right. And first off, over here to the right, it shows me that there's 25,000 members, fully mackerel. That's a lot of people. That's really good. Um, I can click. It shows me that I'm a member, but if I needed to leave for some reason, I can click leave here. This is an information thing, which tells you a little bit more about the group and about settings. And you can set your um, how often you receive notices about the group. But take a look at the different options in the group. There's discussions, there's promotions, there's members, and there's search. So I want, you to show, I want to show you a couple of things. So first of all, when I said posting in groups, this is what I meant. Right next to, right under the main thing here, there's my picture and there's a field. And I started a, I can start a conversation. Hey, there's a great webinar on LinkedIn hosted by AGU right now. Okay? So I could, I could post that if I wanted to. I'm not going to do that, but I could post that. And I could even post a link to the webinar. And that's actually one of the ways I promoted this webinar was by going on LinkedIn and promoting it in the different groups that I'm a member of. So that's something that's, that's proactive posting, right? I'm starting the conversation. I'm, I'm posting an article or a link to a webinar or a link to a video or a link to a picture or a link to an um, award or a fellowship that people can apply for. That's pro proactive posting. That's helping to create the conversation. Now there's another side to that, of course, there is reactive posting. So let me take a quick look at something that somebody posted. So here's somebody, somebody posted this thing right here called Energy and Public Health, the Challenge of Peak Petroleum. This is Jeffrey Doyle. He posted this in AGU. So I'm going to click on that for a moment. And it's going to bring up the discussion. And what Jeffrey Doyle, so it shows me that Jeffrey Doyle posted it, tells me what his headline is. And then it shows me, it gives me a link. He didn't provide any more information. He just provided a link to an NIH, looks like an NIH article. So if I clicked on that, I'd go to the link. It would take me outside of LinkedIn. But what I want you to see is a couple of things. We talk about proactive posting, which is what I did where I was advertising and promoting the webinar. And then there's reactive posting, which is also important. So there's two types of reactive posting that you can do in groups. The first is I comment. You know, thanks, Jeffrey. I type in, thanks, Jeffrey. That was a great article. Um, and maybe, maybe I add a question. You know, so I'm reacting to the post, but I'm still posting. And it, what it's doing is it's, it's showing people in the community that I'm engaged, that I'm interested, and that I want to contribute. And it solidifies in the minds of the publics that I am a contributor. And the more you do this reactive and proactive posting that's public like this, people get to see you, they get to know you, and they get to think of you first if they want to actually 
engage somebody with that skill set. So that's very important. But there's another thing that I can do. So I can also follow him, right? And that's how a lot of people have found me to follow me. I think that's why I have 1,200 people following me is because I post a lot in groups. And so they'll get something that looks like this, except they'll have my picture. And I can like it. As you can see, I can like it. I can comment, which is this, which is this field down here. I can follow where now anytime Jeffrey posts anywhere on the web, I would get informed about it. Or I can reply privately. And this is your way around the in-mail. So if you don't want to spend money on the premium upgrade of LinkedIn, you just want to use the free version, and you want to connect with Jeffrey Doyle, who posted this thing about the challenge of peak petroleum relating to energy and public health, you can reply privately, and it'll send him a private message. So the rest of the public would not see it. And this is a great way to connect with people. It's a really surprising way to actually increase your network, and it's wonderful. Another thing that's really important on, and the surprising way to advance your career is to take a look at the membership directory of the group that you want to join. And this is a tip. Once a month, this is my suggestion to you, once a month of the groups, you, let's say you're a member of 50 groups, so once a month, go through the directory. Casually go through the directory of all the members. And of course, with AGU, that's 25,000 members, so it's going to take you more than just you know a half a day, uh, uh, you know, a half an hour or whatever. But, um, Take some time to go through and take a look and see who are members of the group. And you might be surprised who is a member of the group that you would like to connect with. The first people that come up when you list the group membership are your first degree contacts. So all these people right here that you see I am connected with in first degree. But if I went through the list, I would end up with people that I'm not connected with. And I'd start to see people that I might want to connect with that would be interesting for me. The final thing associated with the groups or the second to final thing associated with the groups that I wanted to point out to you is the search feature. Because you can search for subjects, you can search for people, you can search for locations, departments, colleges, universities, companies, whatever, within the group itself, and it can provide you with some very strategic information. I'm going to go back to the home page of the AGU group page, and I want to show you one last thing, which is latest activity. So it shows you what's the latest activity, what people are posting latest things. And so here, somebody posted on the fact that I, somebody reacted to a post that I said about the webinar. Um, and then there's also subgroups that you can take a look at within the, the group. So there's a lot of things that you can do. OK. So let's go back to the, um, the, the, the um, PowerPoint. So we've done all these different things. And the final thing I didn't mention was looking for top contributors. So people who post to the group quite a lot will also, will also give you information, people you should be connected with. So now with connections, the idea with connections, oh, I just want to show you, the way you find groups is by here, under interests at the top there, scrolling down to groups, and then you can do a search for groups. But you could also do a search for groups right up at the top. So then the other thing you want to do is with connections, you want to find connections. So you can click on connections and then add connections. Um, I encourage people only to add connections with people they either know from another way, or if they want to add connections to somebody that they are just meeting for the first time on LinkedIn, Customize your invitation to connect. So I get lots of invitations from people who want to connect with me, but they just do the, the, the basic default, Elena Levine, you know, Mary Smith wants to connect with you. But Mary doesn't tell me how she knows me or why she'd want to connect with me or anything like that. And that's really important. So if you're going to connect, if you want to connect with somebody who's a stranger, customize the invitation. I saw your, your comments on the HEU group. I thought it was interesting. I'd like to talk to you further. Let's connect. That's a really great way to connect. So um, do connect. You want to do connect. You want to um, make connections. And you know, on, on my profile, I want to show you something on the profile, which I didn't mention before, which is important for you. So I have a number of recommendations. So we talked about why the endorsements for the skills are not that important at the moment. But what is more important on your profile is your recommendations. And so you can. Ask for and offer to give recommendations. The recommendations on your profile and the fact that you've given recommendations are important because these are real people. Of course, they're all real people. But these are people who actually have to think about the recommendation. It's not just me clicking, yes, I endorse Elena for social media skills. It's I have to actually write out, I know Elena's skills in social media because of this reason, and I recommend her to other people who would like to partner with her. And so the more recommendations you have, they're public. People get a chance to see what 
the members of the public think of you, this is a really good thing for you. And it allows you to show allows people to see how what a contributor you are to your community. So it's important. Um, and you want to keep in touch. And so this is a really great tool right up here. I go to connections, keep in touch, I click on keep in touch. And this, what this does is it shows me all the activity that's happening amongst my connections. So for example, it shows me that this colleague here, Aiden Budd, who's one of my contacts, is celebrating a work anniversary. He spent eight years in his company. So I can click here to say congrats. Um, this person right here, Shining Griswold, has a new job. So I can say congrats to her. So staying connected, excuse me, keeping in touch, which you access through connections at the top and then just click on keep in touch, allows you to be dynamic with your connections and can stay connected with them. It's follow, in other words, it's following up with them. Another really cool thing is that you can actually um, uh, you can actually organize your connections, which is so I'm going to click a connection that I have a colleague of mine who is actually my colleague at AGU. So here's Paul Cooper, and he is my contact. And if I click here at the top here, it says contact information, and it tells me what his email address is and so on and so forth. And I can edit the contact information. What that does is it allows me to add other things that only I can see. So I can add his phone number, his address, I can add his birthday. I can even make notes about our relationship, how we met. I can tag him, I can set reminders. So what this does, what LinkedIn does, is it actually serves as an organizational um, software product to help you keep track of your connections. So important, such a great tool for you. So, and only you would be able to see this information. You Only you would be able to make note of how you met and any notes about your relationship. But it's a really good way to keep connected and to keep your connections, know, know what's happening with your connections and remind yourself you know, when you want to meet with them again or when you want to speak to them again. And finally, the other thing I want to do is to remind you in terms of connections is to look through your connections connection. So once a month, this is another tip for you, once a month, go through your, one, pick one connection that you have and take a look at all the people they're connected to. So like if you're my connection, if you are one of my connections, you can see, if you scroll to the bottom, you will see all the people that I'm connected to. Um, I actually have that public. Now you can make that private, by the way. But I make it public because I don't have a problem with that. I want people to see who I'm connected to. So once a month, if you are my connection, it'd be a good idea for you to go through, see who I'm connected to. If you see somebody that you would like me to introduce you to, this is the perfect way to do that, right? If you want to work for Company X and you see that Elena has a connection at Company X, we want to always find an insider, right? We want to create these networking connections so that when you are applying for a job, you have that insider track, you have that person who can hand deliver, so to speak, your resume or CV to the decision maker. And so this is a way to find somebody who is a potential insider. So take a look, pick one person a, uh, a month, look through their connections, See who, who those connections are, where they're working, and if there's anybody that you would like to connect with, you can ask your connection to introduce you to that person, to their connection. I hope that's clear. It's a really, really smart and surprising way to actually advance your uh, knowledge of the industry and also to advance the people, your network. And then finally, the, the other, the last piece of this is the search. And I really want to emphasize here a couple of things, way you can search using LinkedIn. So if you, the first thing is find alumni. So if you hover over connections, the connections bar up at the top, you see a little thing that says find alumni. I'm going to click on that. And up comes this find alumni tool. This is probably one of the best tools, best, best features of LinkedIn because it allows you to find alumni who are in your uh, field or in the area that you want to live in or in the company that you want to work in, it's just extraordinary. So note first thing of all the university that comes up. And you can set any university. You see there's a link here right, right over here to the right that says change school in the blue bar. I could change it to Harvard. I could change it to Caltech. I could change it to any school I want. But right now I'm listing University of Arizona because that's my alma mater. I can change the dates. Um, and then I can also follow it. So if the U of A, as a company, posts something new on LinkedIn, I am informed about that. So now here's the really cool feature of LinkedIn, Find Alumni. It tells me that there's approximately 128,000 LinkedIn users who list the U of A as their school or as their 
current school or as their alma mater. And then it shows me where they live, where they work, what they do, um, where they, what they studied, what they're skilled at, and how I'm connected. So think about this. Let's say I was interested in moving to San Francisco, and I wanted to find people to connect with. I wanted to find people to network with in my alumni sphere. Well, let's click on San Francisco. Okay? Great. It's limiting. Now I find out that 7,500 alumni, who, people on LinkedIn who've listed the U of A as their alma mater, live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And now I can see where they work. And now this is a very interesting data. Look at this data. It says here that 84 U of A alums work for Google. 76 work for Apple. I would have never known that had I not used this tool. So if I wanted to work for Google, I could click on Google, and then what I do is I scroll down here, and it starts listing all of the alumni who work for Google and how I'm connected to them, whether they're a first degree or a second degree or a third degree contact, and I can start connecting with them if I want to do that, if I'm interested in working for Google. Um, let's remove Google for a moment, and let's say I wanted to connect with people who had studied the physical sciences. And I, of course, I always recommend not to limit yourself just to, to the physical sciences, but let's say I did that. So now I can scroll back and I can take a look that for the most of, majority of them, the people who studied physical sciences who, from the U of A who live in the San Francisco Bay Area, most of them work, 11, work for KLA Tensor. But then again, six of them work for Apple. So now I have more of a reason, right? Because if I'm a physics major or a geophysics major, I can reach out to those people that work for Apple that study geophysics um, at the U of A, and here they are, these six people, and I can say, hey, you know, you studied physical sciences, so did I. Maybe we can have a conversation. I'd like to learn more about what you do. So this Find Alumni feature is freaking awesome. It's unbelievably powerful, and I highly, highly encourage you to take more advantage of it. Really just play around with it. Um, the other thing I want you to do is take a look at interests. So under interests, I also showed you groups, right? You saw the groups. But now I'm going to click on companies. So if I click on companies, I can actually follow different organizations, different companies. So I can do a search for a company that I'm interested in, um, for example, AGU, and I can then follow it. And like I said, when you do that, when you're following a company, what happens is every time a co that company posts something, announces something, I am informed of that. So I just want to click on here, and it shows you who I'm following. And right now, the companies that I'm following are 12, 12 organizations. That includes the University of Arizona. It includes AGU. It includes um, National Geographic and Scientific American, Woods Hole. And it also includes the National Post Office Association, among others. So that means that every time they post something, I learn about what they're doing. This is a great way to keep informed, because a lot of companies, organizations, even universities, will post, hey, I have a job open. You should, you know, there's a job announcement. They'll post it on their company page, and you would be informed about that, and that's great. Other thing you want to do is click on this topic right up here that says jobs, right on the top black bar, and you want to search for jobs, right? And you can do a search for keyword, job title, company name, organization. You can do, just sort of look for jobs in your network. So like here, it says that 666 jobs um, exist at Starbucks, and then I have connections to people who um, know people in Starbucks. So this gives me a chance to really explore, if I want to work for Starbucks, who are the people that could potentially be insiders for me. So play around with the search for jobs. And similarly, you can use this search bar right up at the top to search for anything. You can search for people, interests, fields, locations, organizations, and so on and so forth as well as people that you want to follow, like the people that, like people who are following me. Final thing I just wanted to mention about searching is to set how to change your privacy settings so that when you're searching for things, if you want to maintain your privacy, like some of the people who looked at my profile did not want them themselves to be um, seen, right? They wanted to be hidden. So what we can do is we can actually edit our profile to um, change the privacy settings. So what you do is you click on Edit Profile, and then um, you go to edit contact information. Where is it? I lost it. Um, sorry, let me go back over here. Okay, here it is. Um, edit profile, and right over there it says manage public profile settings. So I can manage what people see about me and what people don't see about me. So let's go back to the slide. Okay, so this is what we're doing. And so let me finish up here. LinkedIn, bottom line, is 
LinkedIn is here to stay for now. It's being used in academia. It's being used for academic job searches. Decision makers, hiring managers, search committees are doing LinkedIn searches to find candidates to ask them to apply for jobs, and we want you to be found. So we're going to leverage LinkedIn to promote ourselves, to be found, and to find others. We're going to be strategic about it, right? We're not going to make it a time sink. We're going to have a plan with goals, actions, deadlines, and milestones so that we're actually doing things that move us forward in what we want to do, right? We want, a job. We want our goal is to get a job in industry X, or our goal is to get a job at company Y. So we're going to have a plan that incorporates LinkedIn into that plan that involves actions, very specific actions like certain types of searching, certain types of posting in groups, uh, connecting with people, adding recommendations, things like that, as well as deadlines and milestones. We're going to recognize that the groups do offer the best return on your investment in terms of how much time you spend in LinkedIn, but you should also focus on, of course, your profile, your connections, and your searches, as we talked about. You can share your LinkedIn profile, that customized URL, on your CV, in your email signature, and on your business card. And mostly, most important, on LinkedIn, follow those pillars of social media networking to make sure that you don't make it become a time sink and that you're always being professional and doing things that are reflective of your brand and your attitude and your reputation. So with that, I'd like to just end by saying, hey, guess what? We're having another webinar. Yes, thank you, AG Career, Career, AGU Career Center. It'll be on optimizing your career experience with a focus on what to do with the AGU, AGU phone meeting. This will be happening on December 2nd. And whether you've attended one fall meeting, whether you've attended zero fall meetings, and this is your first one, or you've attended 3,000, which I don't know how it's possible, but maybe you have access to a wormhole that I don't, you will still be able to get value from this webinar. So I'm going to show you what you can do before, during, and after to really maximize your experience, optimize your experience, and expand your network. So I want to thank you so much. I know we ran over a little bit. I appreciate those of you who stuck around. I'm going to stick around for any of the questions that people had. But this is being recorded, as I mentioned, so you'll have a chance to review it um, in your leisure at a later date. I want to thank AGU Career Center again for their formal support of this type of endeavor. And I want to invite you to connect with me. If you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, you can do so. Remind me how you met me, right? Tell me in a customized invitation to connect. You saw my webinar. This is why you'd want to connect with me. You can join my group. I have a group on LinkedIn called Elaine is Alumni. You can follow me on Twitter at Elena G. Levine. You can join me on, link, on Facebook at Quantum Success Solutions. And I hope you'll join me um, in celebrating my new book, which is going to be coming out in February, Networking for Nerds, where I go into even more detail about LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and even some of the other social media tools and channels that you can use for success. So with that, I thank you so much again. It has been an honor and a privilege, as it always is, to work with AGU and to work with you in the audience to help you advance in your career. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I wish you all the best. Enjoy your career adventure. So I'm going to stick around and see if anybody had any questions. A couple of questions here. OK. And any questions that I don't answer, you will be able to find out about um, through a companion article that I will be producing for the uh, AGU website. So uh, a couple of quick questions here. Somebody said, Compared to LinkedIn, how important are, are our Google Scholar profiles and our ResearchGate profiles? Um, just a, I thought that was a great question. Thank you for asking that question. So um, LinkedIn right now is the place to be. Um, certainly, you should have a profile on ResearchGate because people do search that. They look for people, and they also look for people to connect with for research collaborations. So, And Google Scholar, I think, is becoming more prominent, but it's not as prominent as LinkedIn right now. So if you had to spend, if you had, let's say, 10 hours a week to spend on social media, I would spend probably eight of those uh, right now on LinkedIn and maybe two hours on ResearchGate. And I would actually change that week to week. I'd actually spend more time on LinkedIn and less time on ResearchGate. So it's a great question. I know you have, there was a lot of other questions, so I'm just going to answer them in the um, companion article that I'll be producing because we're out of time. But again, thank you all so much for joining me. And um, please stay in touch. Follow me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, join my LinkedIn group, Elena's Alumni, and let's get to success together. Okay? Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody.